some free postcards. Take one and pass them along. And those of you who don't get one, buy the free postcards from the people that have one. <laughs> cinema, cinema, cinema. When I was four years old in Belfast, Northern Ireland, and not without precedent in the annals of childhood, I was playing with my Tonka trucks. I certainly didn't know that one of the most soul-shaping experiences I ever had and will ever have was only weeks away. On December the 18th, 1979, you all know what happened on that date. Of course, Walt Disney Pictures hosted the premiere of The Black Hole, their response to Star Wars. But four-year-old me didn't care about Walt Disney Pictures or that it was a response to Star Wars. I was seduced by the robots. After seeing robots and spaceships in Belfast, of all places, I was hooked. I spent more time at the movies in the next three decades than almost anywhere else. I developed a dual identity. One side of me was attached to the land of my birth, with the crack or liveliness of the Northern Irish culture that called a spade a spade, that could laugh at everything, even while enmeshed in dark political arts. And the other side was colonized by dreams. Some of these dreams, waking ideas and imaginative spaces where I could guess at a different kind of life came from friends and family, or even strangers I met along the way, including perhaps especially the woman who held my hand on the way out of a baseball stadium in Atlanta, Georgia, for about 10 seconds before turning to me and saying, you're not my husband. <laughs> Some of the dreams came from reading books, but mostly they came from the book of life that opened every time the curtain drew back at the ABC, the Curzon Cinema, or the Strand Theatre. Because of the violence that engulfed my community, the limits of home where people were killed because of their voting preferences or religious beliefs or being in the wrong place at the wrong time, where religion was politics and politics was violence, well, these limits were too restrictive for me to accept as the boundaries of being human. And so thankfully, my young life became structured by the works of Steven Spielberg and Martin Scorsese, Ingmar Bergman and Michelangelo Antonioni, Woody Allen and Mike Lee, and perhaps most extraordinarily by Phil Alden Robinson's film, Field of Dreams. Robinson seemed to actually believe that listening to the voice in your head and doing the craziest thing imaginable is sometimes the only way to experience life in anything like fullness. In my overdeveloped teenage cinematic imagination, I visited fields in Iowa, in Provence, and in the north of England. I saw 35-year-old untrained farmers plow under their crops in the hope that dead baseball players might visit. And I felt understood because I too have ridiculous dreams. I watched elderly French farmers in Jean de Florette destroy their hopes by defining community as themselves alone. And I feared for my own country because that's the way we did things too. I saw an inarticulate little boy in Ken Loach's Kess come to life when he gazed at his kestrel soaring above the satanic mills of his broken town and wept when his brother's inarticulacy manifests as a murderous rage because I know what it is to be angry enough to want to kill. Field of Dreams should have kept the name of the book it's based on, Shoeless Joe. Then perhaps so many of us who judge films by their titles or who haven't seen it on the grounds of resistance to perceived sentimentality would be less apt to ignore one of the most emotionally truthful movies ever made. And to those who look down on cinema as a lower art form or because it provokes only apathy in people, well, each to their own. Yet Jean de Florette really is a Shakespearean tragedy translated to early 20th century France. And Kess proves that Loach is as personally compassionate as he is politically committed. You could probably find a better trilogy of cinematically formative art elsewhere, to be sure. But when I was a child, I watched like a child, and I could substitute any number of trios that had emerged into my youthful consciousness. Back to the Future, E.T., and Superman. The Goonies, The Golden Child, and Koyan Eskatsi. Tutsi. Cocoon and Le Grand Bleu, later Tarkovsky's The Sacrifice, Pontecorvo's The Battle of Algiers, and Kurosawa's Ikiru, 
Kishlovsky's Three Colors, later still Scorsese's Shutter Island, Noe's Enter the Void, Regattas's Hapon. But these all formed me as much as the farmers and the kid with the bird. I have become compelled that being human is the biggest thing of all. It's the one thing we're never going to get over, no matter how hard we try. It collapses all boundaries of gender, nationality, politics, ethnicity, and taste. The law, at its best, enshrining human rights, says so. Art, making books and music and paintings that are ultimately about love or the lack of it, and faith, the making and breaking of it, say so too. Religion, well, if you can assume that the times and places in which religious people destroy life are anomalies, or at least not the ideal manifestation of their mystical beliefs, well, religion says that human beings are a little lower than the angels. So maybe we can assert that being human is bigger than a city, bigger than a country, bigger even than movies. And perhaps the highest purpose of cinema and of art generally is to help us live and love better. With that in mind, here's my response to the question if you only watch seven films in your life. Notebooks at the ready. Andrei Rublev, for my money, the greatest film ever made. Tarkovsky's exploration of the life of the 15th century icon writer. This is nothing less than transcendence on screen and every genre wrapped up into one. The Fisher King, Terry Gilliam's film with lovely Robin Williams and Jeff Bridges healing each other, perfect comedy of the human spirit that feels like it's being made while you're watching it. Fanny and Alexander, Ingmar Bergman's film about the brokenness of the human heart, like the best darker films it can be read as either a cry of despair or a telling of the step that comes before the first of the 12 steps, hitting bottom before you recognize that that's what you've done. Smoke, a perfect drama about community and the writing of our own stories that recognizes the power we get to be the interpreters of our own lives. Afterlife, a Japanese film about choosing the beauty of the ordinary in every moment by, Im by imagining which memory from your life you would choose to take into eternity. Duck Soup, the Marx Brothers anti-war movie, like the best satire, it feels like a community you could join. And The New World, the greatest film by Terence Malick, the most lyrical poet of contemporary cinema about the English settlement of America and the concurrent land removal of the indigenous population. A film that climaxes no less than with an affirmation of the discovery of the very location of love. If the purpose of art is to help us live better, and if living better must include an embrace of the astonishing breadth and diversity of humanity, then we must push beyond the boundaries of Hollywood dominated the mainstream. As Richard Rohr says, truth is more likely to be found below and at the margin. So if I were to select Desert Island Disc style, just one example, of cinema that nourishes the global or even the cosmic soul, it would be my friend Mark Cousins's The Story of Film, a 15 hour of wonder, which pays attention to the glory of Asian and Mexican and Senegalese miracles of light equally. It will grant you access to the same place I found in 1979, a magic box in which your own life can be made better in an instant of light thrown on a white screen, animating movement, platforming the song of what it means to be human, made a little lower than the angels in the very image of the divine. Cinema, cinema, 